Hey, welcome back. Uh, we've got an obscure one, uh, another obscure one, I should say, for you this time. It's called Carnival of Blood. Uh, I had not heard of this one before, even though it is from 1970. Uh, Tubi recommended this to me after watching Crucible of Terror, and I was surprised to see it said it was made in 1970 because I thought I had exhausted that year, other than a few that I'm saving for later. But, <clears throat> as it turns out, this was made in 1970 and not released until 1972. But since it was made in 1970, I think it's more appropriate to talk about it with 1970 films. This film was written, produced, and directed by Leonard Kurtman, the only movie he ever directed, and as far as I know, the only movie he ever wrote. He only produced a couple, and he only distributed two. Uh, he also distributed this movie, and what you can see here is that it was a double feature uh, with Curse of the Headless Horseman, which was actually made in 72, so I haven't watched it yet. Uh, let's get, let's see if we can zoom in here. Let's see. There we go. Look at that. <laughs> Hang on. Carnival of Blood with an absolutely ridiculous poster. Uh, what you're seeing on this poster is supposed to be a teddy bear holding a knife and a woman's head at a carnival. Well, actually, it doesn't take place at an actual carnival. It actually takes place on Coney Island, New York City, in Brooklyn, which is very interesting to me. Um, I bet you most of the people that appear in this film didn't even know they were in the movie. That's my guess. There's not much about the production info online, but I'm pretty sure they just went to Coney Island and like guerrilla style made this movie. Um, so it is about, uh, people getting killed at Coney Island. Uh, not supply, not surprising. Um, but this movie Here's what I'm going to say. I got a lot to say about it, actually. But uh, it reminded me of a Herschel Gordon Lewis movie, but better. Um, better than most. Maybe not as maybe not as good as uh, 2000 Maniacs, but probably better than every other Herschel Gordon Lewis movie. Um, and it also reminded me of Maniac very much, and the 1982 Maniac. And it also reminded me of uh, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer because it seemed like it was not a movie, but like real. Um, not like totally real, but like it certainly didn't seem like a Hollywood movie, not even a low budget Hollywood movie. The acting in it, in my opinion, was mostly very good to the point where it didn't feel like it was acting. It felt like the people were really talking. For example, it starts off with a couple at Coney Island and the man wants to go home and the woman wants to stay and go on more rides and eat more things and do more attractions. And it really felt like those two were in a relationship. It really felt like the guy was exhausted. It really felt like the girl was annoyed that her boyfriend wanted to go home. And actually... She was so, she was nagging her boyfriend so much, like, I felt bad for the guy. Like, he really wanted to go home. And she was like, just one more thing. And then he's like, okay. And then they did one more thing. And then she's like, just one more thing. And, <clears throat> like, I'm not sure if it was supposed to be funny or not, but I could feel, like, I know what the guy felt like. Like, the girl kept asking for more and more and more. <laughs> And, uh, she ends up, they end up going on a, actually, they end up, well, they do a lot of things, but one of the things they do is they go to a fortune teller, classic, right? And the fortune teller is reading her tarot cards, and then she gets to a point where she gets so freaked out by what she reads in the tarot cards that she says she can't read them anymore, and that she's not feeling well, and that please go directly home after they leave. So basically, the psychic can tell that something bad is going to happen, okay? And so then what they do is they end up going on a ride, even though the guy really wants to go home, and they go on a ride, 
And when they get off the ride, or when the ride ends, and it's kind of like a little roller coaster, but like a haunted roller coaster, they go through and it's like a haunted house, but you're in like a cart on a track. When they get finished, and it's time to get out of the cart, the girl's head falls off. And so some one or something has killed the girl in the middle of the ride, and the boyfriend didn't even know. Someone just cut her head off, but actually, like, in such a way that it didn't fall off <laughs> until the ride was over, and then when the ride was over, it fell off. Um, <clears throat> so it's pretty gory in parts. Actually, it's very gory, especially for 1970. In fact, if you remove all the Herschel Gordon Lewis films from existence, it's one of the goriest films up to the point, uh, along with uh, I Drink Your Blood. So like this, I Drink Your Blood, and the Herschel Gordon Lewis films are like the goriest films you could see up to this point, okay? So that right there makes it stick out a little bit. Now this looks, it really feels like, I don't know what the actors got paid, but it feels like an extremely low budget film. Like, I don't know how much. They probably didn't get any permits to film it. Uh, the actors probably got next to nothing. Um, I mean, it's they, the actors barely tried to act, which worked very well because it just felt real. There's other movies out there like, uh, you know... Like uh, those Andy Milligan movies where the acting is so bad that it's hard to watch. This is not like that. It's not even like a Herschel Gordon Lewis film where the acting is bad. The acting wasn't bad. It, 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 these characters, to me, felt like they could have been real people. It's, it's very different than a typical low-budget film, in my opinion. Also, the level of gore that they put in there is so much beyond what other movies were doing. It surprises me that this movie is like completely obscure. Um, but then again, maybe I'm appreciating things that most people wouldn't appreciate because uh, on the other hand, you have like many scenes aren't even in focus. <laughs> so like obviously people wouldn't like that. Um, I think a lot of people would just take a look at this and be like, oh, this is garbage. Like the camera's like a little shaky. The camera's at odd angles a lot of the time, probably because they were hiding it from the people. Because <laughs> I think a lot of the people in this movie didn't know they were in a movie. <laughs> um, so you got to get past that type of thing. But if you can, it's really good. And there are surprises. The story is well written. You don't know who the killer is at first. Then you think it's one guy. Then you think it's another guy. Then you don't know who it is. You're trying to figure out the motivation. You're trying to figure out the patterns because they set up a pattern with the first person who gets killed. And it really doesn't match the second one. And so you're trying to figure out if there is a pattern or what. And then uh, at the end... Some things kind of do come apart a little bit. Uh, they try to go kind of down an artistic pathway for the reveal, which I don't think worked that well. But everything up until that was really good. So I give this a 7 out of 10. Um, there were points where I thought it was going to be an 8 out of 10. And then the end was like kind of bad, so I had to drop it down. And maybe a 7 out of 10 and is a little generous. That's what I'm giving it. Uh, I liked it a lot. Um, so I recommend you go watch it on Tubi if you don't mind some ultra low budget and high gore. Uh, if you're not into that, <laughs> don't watch it. But you probably are if you're watching this channel. Anyway, uh, now I will talk about plot points that would be spoilers. So if you haven't seen it yet and you want to, pause the video. Anyway, here we go. So... What we have here, as you now know if you've watched the movie, is we have these people at, at the uh, booth where you have to throw the dart, hit the balloons, and, uh, oh, you know, I should have said this, I should have said this before the uh, spoiler warning, but we've got, uh, oh my, Burt Young is in it. But this is Burt Young in this movie, it's his first movie ever. And uh, Burt Young is most known for playing Rocky's friend in Rocky. Uh, so this is him in Rocky, which I think came out like four years later. 
so that's him there. Okay, and this is, so that's 19, ugh, don't be mad at me if I say this wrong. I'm not a Rocky super fan, but uh, I think Rocky came out in 74. And so this is four years early, 1970. He plays a hunchback, pock-faced, slightly deformed Carney, who is an assistant at the balloon popping station. And the main balloon popping station guy is this guy who, honestly, he was good. I, he was, I thought he was a good actor. Uh, he, the writing and the directing did a good job of putting depth into these characters. For example, you can tell that the main balloon popping Carney uh, has some kind of issue with women. But it's not super obvious until he, it gets explained later. But uh, some, like when the original couple comes up to play the game, the, the girl is really demeaning to the guy because he can't pop the balloons. And then she kind of like says like she's going to go home with a different guy who can pop the balloons. And the, the, the carny is like, hey, like give him a break. Maybe if, maybe if you're more supportive, he'll you know, do better. And he's like really defending the guy and he ends up giving the guy the prize. I don't know if he even popped enough balloons to get the prize, but he ends up giving the guy the prize and the guy gives it to the girl. The prize is almost always a teddy bear, hence the teddy bear that we have in the poster. Right, let's see if we can get that zoom again. Although the teddy bear in this poster does not look like the teddy bear in the movie, but anyway, it seems, as you may know if you watched it, that the teddy bear seems to be like a mark. Like, whoever gets a teddy bear is going to die. Later, there's this sailor, and the sailor's really drunk now. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they got this dude super drunk just for the, like, scene. But the sailor's really drunk, falling all over himself, meets up with a girl at Coney Island, Ends up winning her a bear. But instead of getting killed on the ride, they, I think they go on the ride. I think. And she doesn't get killed on the ride, but later she gets killed, like, under the pier. And, uh, later, <laughs> this woman, this has got to be the, this might be the best part of the movie. This ridiculous looking woman with these crazy early 70s glasses, type of gra glasses my gra great grandmother used to wear. They're like these like pointy, like horned glasses, horn, I don't know. Is that horn rimmed glasses? I don't know. These crazy glasses. She complains about how expensive everything on Coney Island is. She tries to rip off the, the carnies. She cuts in line to get some fried shrimp at one point. And like, I think, at least I want to believe that the people she cuts in line from, uh, of the people she cuts in line are just customers. I don't think that they knew they were in a movie. Um, the angle of the camera at that point is odd, although the camera is behind the counter, so they probably got permission to be behind the counter, like they could have sneaked behind the counter. But I don't think the customers knew they were in a movie, and so this lady just pushes ahead of them, and they're like kind of complaining. And she's like, oh, I've been waiting to, I've been waiting to, we're all waiting, we're all waiting, I'm hungry, I need some shrimp. And then, like, they give her, like, a plate of shrimp, and then she's like, put another one on there. <laughs> and then they put another one, she's like, all right, put another one on there. And, like, she's just so obnoxious, so you know she's gonna die. And uh, so at least two of the three people that die, like, out of the three victims, you really want them to. Uh, there's also this scene where the main carny, whose name is Tom, brings uh, your boy, Burt Young, back to his house for apparently the first time ever. And uh, Burt Young's name is Gimpy in the movie. And they have this, like, getting to know each other conversation. And it feels really real. <laughs> like, it's obviously not... Uh, Burt Young obviously doesn't talk like how Gimpy talks, but it's believable. And uh, it comes out that Gimpy, like, killed his dog, and he doesn't want to talk about why. And uh, he lives alone, doesn't have a family. And you get the feeling that maybe he did something bad to his family. 
And there's just like kind of a lot of depth for such a low budget like gore movie. It, there's kind of a lot of depth in there to these characters. There's also, uh, I guess you could say the main protagonists are these neighbors of the of Tom, the carney, and the the bo the the fiance, the male, is like he just got a new like job as a journalist or a new promotion as should say as a journalist and he's trying to figure out who's killing the people and uh he like drags his fiance out to the scene of the crime and she really doesn't want to go and he forces her to go and uh tom the carney like always takes the guy's side even though he seems to be better friends with the girl and she kind of vents to him and, she, and he's like well you gotta treat your fiance right like don't you know like you probably yelled at him. You probably weren't listening to him. You're not being supportive. Like, he really, like, blames her. And she's like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm just coming to vent to you, and you're blaming me for this stuff that my fiancé did. I don't know. I just really liked it. Uh, at the end, the guy kind of snaps. He, <laughs> Tom, Tom snaps. He kills Gimpy for, like, not much of a reason, although I think he realizes Gimpy can't be trusted because he's a psycho, but they're both psychos. And uh, you find out that Tom's mother cheated on her father and abused him, Tom, as a child. And then in a fight, this is kind of messed up, actually. I, w I didn't see this coming. While their parents were fighting, he was locked in a room. He got locked in his bedroom because the mother was cheating on the father, and then the father came home. I don't think he realized that the kid was in the room. And then in the fight, the house ends up getting burned down. Unfortunately, you don't see it. You only hear it, which is one of the weaker areas of the movie. But the house gets burned down with the little kid in it. And so he's scarred for life, and that's what makes him all messed up as an adult and makes him hate women and makes him want to, I guess, kill. He basically, the pattern is he kills women that are like mean to men. It's kind of something different. Anyway, uh, it, the, the last piece of the movie really feels like Maniac, even though it's 12 years before Maniac, but <clears throat> it really feels like Maniac. Uh, it's like dingy, grimy New York City setting. Not saying New York City is necessarily grimy today, but in 1970, it certainly seemed to be. And in 1982, for that matter. Uh, and so it really felt like Maniac at the end. There's a part in the middle where they were talking in their apartment that really reminded me of Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, which, of course, didn't get made until the 80s and not released until later. So did these movies pull from Carnival of Blood? I mean, probably not. I mean, maybe. Maybe Maniac did. Because Maniac's New York City. So maybe the people that made Maniac saw Carnival of Blood at, like, some grindhouse in 1972 and, like, were influenced by it. Maybe. Right? But it's very possible that no one even saw this movie and it did things that more popular movies did later and the other movies get credit for it, but actually Carnival of Blood was doing some of these things all the way back in 1970. So in my opinion, it's valuable. If you like low budget horror movies, it's valuable. I know I talked about it a lot, but actually, if you, if you haven't seen it, I mean, the performances and the vibe of the movie can actually not be spoiled by just discussing it. You kind of have to experience it. And uh, I'm glad that I didn't like go to sleep hearing that carnival music because you hear it a lot throughout the movie. There's this like, you know, Coney Island ride music that you hear a whole lot. So anyway, I guess that's enough uh, for Carnival of Blood. But this was a pleasant surprise. Ridiculous poster, ridiculous movie copied possibly by accident multiple times later but uh i guess you could almost call it like a like a slasher but it didn't really feel like a there's too much depth in the characters for it to be a slasher in my opinion you just know you just learn too much about the characters for it to be a slasher slashers are all gore 
little substance, like 90% out of the time. This actually had a lot, quite a bit of substance, considering what a cheapo, almost would say amateur film, but it had a lot of heart. That's not a gore joke, by the way. All right, that's enough uh, for Carnival of Blood. If you made it this far, go ahead and like the video or comment or do subscribe or something like that because we're still trying to get that algorithm to be back in my favor. Because unfortunately, probably very few people are going to see this pushed by YouTube and then they'll never know about Carnival of Blood. And that's very sad. So do what you can to help the algorithm get back to where it was, where 4,000 people were watching this stuff each day. Because then movies like this can be reappreciated by people who would be interested in them. All right, talk to you later.